Welcome to the M3 Report, your place for all things metals, markets, and money. I'm your host, Dave Russell of goldcore.com, your precious metals experts. And eager fans amongst you will recall that last time our theme was the floor is lava. Where, we asked, could anyone turn to without getting burned? Be it inflation, food shortages, political divides, bond markets, equity markets, and even saber rattling in Taiwan. It's all very, very shaky. With this in mind, it felt irresponsible of us not to dedicate a whole episode to the energy crisis. The impact of high energy costs is being felt across the Western world, and it is a feature of every aspect of our lives, whether in political speeches, when we're filling up the car with fuel, or worrying if our kids' schools can afford heating this winter. But why is energy so obscenely expensive right now? In fact, why is everything so expensive right now? Things are so bad that Scottish Prime Minister Nicola Sturgeon has labelled the energy crisis a humanitarian crisis. If you believe the mainstream media and your democratically elected politicians, then we can all blame Putin. But this is a blinkered view to say the least. Now, I was a bit up against it this week, so I asked Jan Scoyles to set the record straight and explain how we got where we are today. Surging inflation in product and commodity markets had become a reality long before the events of this year. The world has been driven into this situation by many years of irresponsible macroeconomic policies pursued by the G7 countries, including uncontrolled emission and accumulation of unsecured debt. Unable or unwilling to find other solutions, the governments of leading Western economies simply accelerated their money printing machines and used this ignorant method to cover their unprecedented budget deficits. Over the past two years, the money supply in the United States has grown by more than 38%. That's $5.9 trillion. The EU's money supply has also increased dramatically over this period. It grew by about 20% or 2.5 trillion euros. Today's rising prices, accelerating inflation, shortage of food and fuel and problems in the energy sector are the result of system-wide errors in the economic policies of the current US administration and European bureaucracy. So they printed money in huge quantities and then what? Where did all that money go? It obviously went towards purchasing goods and services outside the West. This is where the newly printed money flowed. They literally began to vacuum up and sweep out global markets. The interests of other states, including the poorest ones, were disregarded. They were left with scraps at exorbitant prices. While at the end of 2019, the US imported about $250 billion of goods per month, this figure has now grown to 350 billion. It is worth noting that the growth was 40%, exactly in proportion to the unsecured money supply printed in recent years. They handed out printed money and used it to sweep up goods from the markets of third countries. Obviously, such a sharp increase in demand without adequate supply has triggered a wave of shortages and in global inflation. This is where global inflation originates. Dave, I have a bit of a confession to make. I know you asked me to write something that would set us up to discuss energy prices and how we got to this point. I wanted to find a way to explain where the inflation that we are experiencing today, whether in energy prices or food prices or labor costs originated. I wanted to find a way to explain that the wheels for high inflation were in motion long before Russia invaded Ukraine. And I found this speech and it said everything I wanted to say, but here's the thing. Putin gave that speech and it's a tricky one but you know Putin has invaded Ukraine and to me that is reprehensible he is committing terrible crimes on behalf of his country apparently but what this speech shows is that Putin has identified where our true weaknesses lie and it's not because of this attempt to creep into Europe it's not just about Ukraine and access to Europe and access to the resources that are there no, Putin has identified that our biggest weakness in the West is our financial system and the damage that has been caused to our money supply over decades, all in the name of growth. Putin might have lit a match when it comes to Ukraine, but sadly it's a campfire compared to the forest fire that's ready to burn through the Western financial system. And he, along with several other leaders, is ready to exploit that weakness. Okay, well, that wasn't quite what I was expecting from Jan, but... If anyone's going to cut corners to get to the point, then it's her. And quite frankly, she's right. Talk about cognitive dissonance. Of course, it makes us feel very uncomfortable using something Putin has said by way of making our argument. But the fact is, he's right. The West is very much to blame for the economic predicament that they now find themselves in. And Putin is exploiting it. As the media sees it, Putin has two arsenals. His military arsenal and his energy arsenal. But actually, there's a third arsenal and it's much, much bigger and much more potent. 
the weakness of the financial system. Putin might have started a war in Ukraine, but we're entering an undeclared war as currencies of Russia and beyond go head to head with the Western financial system. Much of what Jan and Putin says reminds me of something that friend of Gold Corps Brent Johnson talks about, his dollar milkshake theory. Brent's theory is essentially about a sovereign debt crisis and how a world flooded with US dollars can make for a very dangerous time indeed. Yeah, in really simple terms, it's just an analogy that I have used to explain what, how I think a global uh, currency crisis or sovereign debt crisis would play out. Um, I typically take it back to 2008, but we could probably take it out long before that. But since 2008, you know, all countries around the world have, you know, provided an enormous amount of stimulus, you know, to their relative economies, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, the ECB, you know, the Chinese Central Bank, the, the Fed. And so they provided all this liquidity, they printed all the money, however you want to describe that, uh, you know, that monetary policy. Um, but for several reasons, which we've kind of touched on today, I think the dollar and the US market is going to capture all of that liquidity that has been provided. Not because it deserves it, not because it's fair, or not because I want it to be that way, but just because I think that's the design of the system. Um, and I think that all that liquidity is going to get pulled into the United States as we enter a crisis. And I think that will, that will deprive the rest of the world of liquidity. And at the end of the day, liquidity is the most important thing. And so as the U.S. has provided liquidity and the rest of the world is deprived of that liquidity, I think it kind of becomes a self-perpetuating phenomenon. And that's where you could get the, the dollar and the U.S. markets sucking up all that capital into the U.S. markets and the rest of the markets, you know, being uh, under severe pressure. Uh, and I got the name from a movie called There Will Be Blood about an oil baron who, um, you know, he was negotiating a piece of land with his, with his neighbor and his neighbor really wanted this guy to buy his land. And the guy finally said, I don't have to buy your land. All I have to do is stick a straw down into the ground and I can drink up your oil. He said, I'll drink your milkshake. And so that's kind of where I got the ideas. Um, at the end of the day, in a global market where capital can move around the world, it's not as important who provides the liquidity, it's more important who captures the liquidity. And I think, uh, you know, perhaps not for fair reasons, but I think the US is gonna capture that liquidity. Brent Johnson envisions a scenario where the US dollar sucks up liquidity from other currencies and countries worldwide. And right now, outside of the US, we're seeing inflationary pressures in local currency terms, but deflationary pressures in US dollar terms. And of course, this is the worst of both worlds. This situation rapidly becomes a self-perpetuating disaster. As John indicated earlier, this is not a story that ends well. A dollar increase of, say, 20% against all other fiat currencies will have a dramatic effect on global markets. We'll see more volatility and an exacerbation of the issues we're already experiencing today. So... Is it totally incorrect to say that Russia is solely to blame for the current energy prices and the struggles people are facing to heat their homes? Not exactly, says my guest, Steve St. Angelo. Now I'm going to start by asking you, uh, according to basically the mainstream media and every single politician that we hear, this energy crisis in Europe is caused by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That's the narrative that we're being fed. What's the truth? Well, there is some truth to it, but let's let's dissect that. Uh, the the crisis in Europe started before the Russian Ukraine war, and that's I mentioned this. That's because uh, green energy, wind especially, underperformed in the summer. You had a very hot summer, and then there was a very cold winter mm. before the Russian Ukraine war. And what that did is it drew down natural gas inventories, and so and then. Europe was trying to build back up its inventories and Russia kind of held back because not because Russia, this is before the, the war, Russia's inventories in the first quarter of 2021 were at 19 percent, their own inventories in Russia. So they were scrambling to build their natural gas inventories for their own people. So they had cut natural gas uh, uh, exports to Europe and it wasn't anything you know, uh, it, it was due to that reason. You take care of your own country first. And so that started the whole problem. And then then, of course, the Russian-Ukraine war happened. And 
it, yes, part of the problem with the higher prices were due to the Russian-Ukraine war, but it's probably more, Dave, due to the U.S. and NATO policies against Russia due to this Russian-Ukraine war. And so there is the sanctions and now there is the price caps on oil and the price. They tried to do price caps on natural gas. And the more that Europe tried, it's and this is how I look at what Europe is doing against Russia, whether we agree with it or not. It's kind of like homeowners telling the bank what interest rate they're going to pay their loan back for their home and how they're going to pay back the home loan. And the bank says to them, well, listen, if you're going to be that way, we'll forget it. We'll just we'll just take control over the house again. So get it, get out of the home. We'll take control of the house and you don't have to worry about paying your mortgage. And so that's when Russia decides or Putin, they're going to cut the they're going to stop flowing the gas. And so this is the kind of the insanity that's going on uh, on on kind of both sides. And so I think the the escalation of these supply and demand dynamics have pushed the price of natural gas. But I have to tell you, even though the natural gas price in Europe has come down from $100 US dollars uh, per unit uh, about a month ago, month and a half, now it's down in the 50s, 60s, 50s range, it's still six, seven times above the five year average. Mm -hmm. So that's very, even though it's lower, it's still six, seven times above the five-year average. And, and, and so it's got, it has a long way to go before um, Europeans are, 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 be, are able to survive you know, these huge energy prices. Now tell us, Steve, how, how did, how did uh, Germany and Europe in general become so reliant on gas from Russia as a, as a major source of energy? Well, you see, it's it's um, well, let, let, let's look at Europe and the United States and even Asia. Asia is very heavily dependent. Matter of fact, I have a chart. Europe, if we look at the regions in the world and we find out what gas they produce and then we find out how much gas they import mm. and you get a number and Europe is number one. They're the largest net importers of natural gas in the world. Asia comes in second. And the only other region in the world that imports a little bit is Central and South America. And then right. Africa, North America, the Middle East, and Russia and the CIS states, they're all net exporters. Now, here's, here's, here's where it's, it's very interesting. North America, which mostly the U.S., and Middle East export last year 24 billion cubic feet a day of natural gas. 24. Russia exported 22. So Ru Russia is the big dog. So mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't matter if you say we're going to uh, wean off of Russia. You can't wean off of Russian natural gas because Russian natural gas is almost as much as North America and the Middle East. Now the Middle East does produce a lot of natural gas, Dave. But they consume a lot of it themselves. They consume a lot of it. So uh, this is the problem. This is the problem that they're trying to figure out. And unfortunately, there's no. And, and lastly, be, because the world is moving more towards green, especially in Europe and even the United States, even though the Europe is, is seeing more problems with natural gas prices because they're more heavily dependent on imports, the United States is doing the same thing. They're getting rid of coal. And they're bringing on more green energy, wind and solar. Mm -hmm. But we're producing a lot more natural gas. So we're OK for, for now, because if you're going to if you're going to add green energy, wind and solar, you have to have natural gas balancing power. And that's that's but the reason. Why is, the, why is that? Why is it? Well, how is it? Why is it a balancing? Uh, well, why does it play that balancing function? Well, because you see, the wind is not the wind, especially. Uh, well, the wind is much more volatile than the sun, and unless you because during the winter there's a lot more overcast, so there's a lot less solar power, especially in Germany. But the wind can stop when the wind stops, or the wind the winds really slow down. Then then the the, the wind power can fall from about. It, it could fall dramatically. And the only way to make that up, you can't ramp up nuclear. You can ramp up coal a bit. But the only way to offset that massive volatility of wind power is with natural gas. 
And that's what they're doing. They're doing that in Australia. They're doing that in the United States. They're doing that in, in Europe. And so this is this is the problem. And so the, the Europe has been getting rid of coal and nuclear. And they've been adding a lot of wind and solar. And that that's fine when it works. But when wind and solar, you know, they become very volatile, that their production declines for a period of time, then you've got to ramp up natural gas. You can't really do it with nuclear and you really can't do it with coal. And just drive so into I, that uh, nuclear uh, comment for a second. You can't do it with nuclear. Why is that? Is that because it's producing a constant level of, uh, of, of energy, is it? Yes, nuclear, when you run a nuclear power plant, these things can run at a 90 in the 90s, they call it uh, capacity utilization. If if you could run an electric plant at 100%, that's called 100% capacity utilization. Mm -hmm. uh, nuclear can run safely at 93, 94%. Like natural gas plants, they run like 40, 45, 50%. Coal, about the same thing. Coal can run higher. You can run coal plants much higher. But that's when you look at the whole system. Now, wind, wind is very volatile. If you get 20% out of wind, and then it's 25% out of wind, and then maybe 20, 15, 20% out of solar. And so, but then the problem is you can run a nuclear power plant at 93%. And then you can't ramp it up much more than that. And so when you look at these power grids, you look at the, the coal and the nuclear. Nuclear is this flat line. It goes up a little bit and it goes down a little bit, but it's basically a flat line. Coal goes up and down. Natural gas is the one that is huge waves because it's it's being brought on for more consumption. And also it's, it's used, being used to offset any intermittency with wind and solar, because you really can't do that with nuclear. You can't turn nuclear up like you can natural gas. And this is another problem that we're seeing as countries and regions start to uh, increase their wind and solar production. I, I, it's a recipe for disaster, unfortunately. Okay. And that is because of the lack of consistency that is available there from both solar and from wind. So therefore, you naturally have a are building in a more of a reliance to natural gas when we do this. Is that would that be a fair comment? Yeah, and you know, we went from I called a stable uh, coal and nuclear because nuclear started being ramped up in the sixties and seventies. 80s. Um, and, and so you had very stable baseload power. And usually if you go to a coal fired plant, you're going to have uh, three months of coal, typically three months of coal at that plant. And then there's the coal that's in, in different deposits that are being transported. So you've got a three month supply of coal. We have that in the United States. With natural gas, you got you have maybe 30 days. So we went from a very stable nuclear and base low coal to now I call it just in time. And just in time is very, it's it, it, because the wind is very, it, it fluctuates, solar fluctuates, it shuts off totally at night, right? There's no solar at night. And so you've got to bring on natural gas to offset the solar because people at night are using power. And, and, and so, and then wind in the, in the summer really shuts down. And so if, you, if you've added 20%, 25% wind power to your grid, and then in the summer it just dies, well, then you've got to make it up somewhere or people are going to burn up, right? We're seeing that. People are not, don't have enough air conditioning. So you have to bring on the, the natural gas. And really natural gas is the only thing that can do it. So we're moving to green natural gas, very just in time, very volatile. So we went from stable grid to now a very volatile grid and natural gas can make that possible only if natural gas production in the world continues to increase. I think we're going to have problems with natural gas production in the future. So the whole thing really starts to fall apart if you don't have the natural gas. And Europe would have produced natural gas over the last number of decades, but those levels have significantly dropped now. Is that correct? Well, yes. And this is this is, uh, you know, some might say, well, that's due to environmentalism. Possibly that's partly true. But uh, uh, 
you know, the natural gas, we, we went into shale in the United States. And, and so we now we see that maybe Europe or England wants to do that so they can get more natural gas. But still, and just for those that don't know, can you explain just very briefly what that means, uh, shale? OK, well, uh, the old way we would we would drill vertical wells and get oil and then you would also do the same for natural gas. You have, there's like natural gas fields and then also you get natural gas from oil. Matter of fact, when old conventional oil wells deplete, you, you tend to get natural gas. That's how you know the wells getting old and, de and, and depleting. You get more natural gas that mm. that shows you. And so but now what we're doing is we're doing this horizontal fracking. We go down about a mile and we send out these laterals They're Now they're two miles long and we put all these the holes. We put all these perforations and we frack, send down millions of pounds of sand and water to frack the shale to release the oil and natural gas. And it works really well with natural gas. It does with oil, but it depletes very quickly with oil. And so now we did that because we have the infrastructure to do that. Uh, other places around the world aren't set up really for that, but maybe England is. And so now to get more, the natural, the, the conventional natural gas just in Europe has depleted, just like it did in the United States. We ran out of conventional natural gas or the good quality. And we now we made it up with shale. And we see that maybe in Europe or in England, they want to try to get the net shale gas. And they may they may be able to do that. But again, this shale gas is, is not going to last hundreds of years. Right. It, you know, it, it, it it's a boom and bust, too. And that's what I, I talk about at the, on my website. Uh, that it, it's going to be a boom and a bust, even though it could be a, a big boom. It's a big bust, too. It's not something to rely on for decades and decades and decades. OK, so it's a kind of a, a, a combination or a confluence of factors here in terms of which which has allowed us in Europe to become hypersensitive to the supply of gas from um, from Russia. So one of the things is it's a reduction in the amount of gas, natural gas that's being produced in Europe. And that's not being replaced by the same methods, i.e. fracking and shale, that has uh, replaced the, the, the natural gas production in the US. Um, and then on, on, on top of that, then, we've also got the problem of more reliance on green energy, on the solar and on the wind, and the inconsistencies of those, which can really only be compensated for with natural gas yeah and and it's even worse than that and i'll tell you why and i hate to be the party pooper the, the when they call green energy renewable wind and solar it's not renewable mm. the wind is renewable i mean you, you open your door you go outside the wind's going to blow and we don't have to pay for that it's mm. it's free. we could call it free. Right. And the sun is going to shine for a billion years or two billion years. And that's free for us. So that energy is renewable. What we use to capture that energy, the wind turbines, the blades, the solar panels and all that is not renewable. And they have a lifespan. And a wind turbine, really, it's about 15 years mm. plus or minus. And the wind and the wind blades actually wear out. You got to replace those. And the solar panels, you get about 25 years. So if you ramp up all this stuff, well, you have to replace it. It's, it's not going to last a thousand years. And so when you add all this, now you have to start replacing it. And now the problem is a lot of solar and wind. We're seeing that the last wind turbine plant, uh, Nordex in Germany, shut down in June. Mm. They also shut down their wind blade plant. And so... This is the problem. You have to replace all that stuff. And, and these, you know, coal plant, they can last 50, 60 years. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a natural gas plant, that can last 50, 40 years, 50 years, even a nuclear power plant can. And so the problem is these things are not renewable. Once they reach their lifespan, you, you have to replace them. And so when, as time goes on, Dave, it, it's going to become very problematic to replace these. And so the, the world's grids are going to come under serious pressure 
with the ability to maintain electric power as we head over what I call the energy cliff, which is oil, which allows all the other energy sources to function. And we're not going to be able to re be replacing a lot of these wind turbines and solar panels. And so it, it's unfortunately going to be a very, a very big problem uh, be, above and beyond the issues with Russia and natural gas. So what's the root out of this? Well, you know, people ask me, Steve, what's the problem? What's the solution? And you, the, the thing is, you can have a solution to a problem, but you can't have a solution to a predicament. Right. And right now we're facing a predicament. And so the wise minds say we have to figure out a managed degrowth because, and, we, you know, the, it's the oil problem. That's that's where I the oil is the number one energy source that drives this entire economy. Everything else comes after it. And so if you have problems with oil, then you have problems with all other energy sources. And so if we know that, and it is true, there are, still is debate about it. But if, if we have problems with oil and we're going to have problems with energy sources, the only wise thing to do is to figure out how to manage our economies as this oil production declines. So, and, but unfortunately we're not doing that. We're, 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 we're trying to ramp up more green energy and we're, we're actually going in the wrong direction. That is a predicament. Um, okay. So we're, we're, we're really at a, a situation in the short term where we're being effectively held hostage by a number of different things, and some of them are government policies that have been put in place with respect to the uh, environment and green energy that has led us to become hypersensitive to the supply of, of energy. Uh, and we now have found ourselves in a situation where effectively Russia has weaponized energy supplies. Um, and we have found ourselves, the West, the response to the West, um, and the sanctions that have been put in place have actually made these problems worse. And there's talk about energy caps in the UK. They're talking about putting a, introducing a cap on energy, what uh, consumers pay for their, for their energy. And that sounds great, but ultimately what that means is there's no cap on what uh, what price, the, the wholesale price of energy. So the difference between what the consumer pays for it and what the energy is bought at is going to be funded through uh, exchequer borrowing, somewhere between 150 and 170 billion pounds sterling. So we're in an energy crisis, which is contributing to a cost of living crisis. We've got inflation in the US. It's at eight and a bit percent officially in the in in various different places in Europe. It's it's 10 percent and above. Um, they're talking about potentially inflation in the UK of 18 to 20 percent. And our response to this is by making another inflationary move. This is not going to end well, is it? No, and I, you see, there's a there's a good way to bring this all into perspective, and uh, and I mentioned this in one of my Twitter Spaces is that we had the 1961 uh, Cuban Bay of Pigs. Now this is U.S. centric, mm. and then we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. Remember that? Yes. And then we and then we had the assassination of a president, John F. Kennedy. And then we had the U.S. enter the Vietnam War, where we dropped, we rolling thunder, we dropped more bombs on Vietnam than we did in the entire World War II. And then we had the, uh, the seven-day Arab-Israeli War in 1967. And then in 1968, we had the assassination of Martin Luther King, huge protests in the United States. And then we had the assassination of Senator Kennedy, who was running, Robert Kennedy running for president. And in those seven years, we had all these massive geopolitics. And you know what the, do you know how that impacted the price of oil? Hmm. Nothing. It stayed at $1.80 in 1961 to $1.80 in 1969. No, there's no volatility. And so why was that? Because the world was bringing on all this wonderful energy supply, Dave. 
from from the United States was still bringing on more oil. All that oil we found in in the Middle East was coming on. So it didn't matter if the world almost came to a nuclear war, or we 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 you know we had an assassination of one of the presidents of the United States. It didn't matter. But now it matters. All these little things matter because we're running a world now at 100 miles an hour. And that's how I call it. We're running a car at 100 miles an hour, and it's not designed to do that. We're running the world at 100 million barrels of oil production per day or close to it. And now that's what it's designed to. We've built up this infrastructure to run it at, and we it's hard to maintain it. So now if there's any problems with supply and demand, there's huge volatility now because we're not going to be able to add much more energy going forward. And so now when you have any of these issues, geopolitics, we have these massive volatility and this is just beginning. So unfortunately, what's happening with you're talking about in the UK by printing money to uh, fix the, the price cap. This is uh, governments trying to do something to offset the energy cliff dynamics. And unfortunately, it's just going to get worse because since the financial crisis, Dave, the world has added 12 million barrels a day of growth of oil production. And most of it, US and Canada, 85%. And now U.S. is going to get into trouble with shale oil. It's going to get into serious trouble. I see it collapsing over the next eight years. And so when we understand if you're going to print money, as they're going to do in U.K. and Europe and elsewhere, you can do that if you add oil. But if you don't add the oil like we have in the last 12, 14 years, you look like Venezuela because they printed money. And they didn't increase their energy. Actually, their energy production fell. And what do you have? You have hyperinflation. So I think the scenario that we're looking forward to, and I'll conclude here, is things that we own, investments we own, real estate, stocks, and bonds are going to get into serious trouble. They're going to deflate. Even though we could see them really shoot up due, due to you know, volatility, but the problem is it's going to be things that we consume are going to go up, and especially food and energy. That's where the real inflation, because when those prices go up, then the housing prices have to come down because you can't, that's the, that's the give and take. Mm -hmm. And so this is the problem the world on a whole is going to face going forward. We're going to have huge inflation and things we consume, but it's going to be volatile. The prices are going to be very volatile up and down. My thanks to Steve San Angelo of SRS Rocco Report for joining us on the M3 Report. And you can see our full interview with him sometime next week. And you can learn more about Steve's services by clicking the link in the show notes for this episode. And stick around for later in the show when he joins me again on Chart Watch to discuss silver. So, to take it back to what Steve was saying about the impact of Russia on gas prices, does this mean that the sanctions that have been put in place are going to have very little effect on either our reliance on fossil fuels or Putin's invasion of Ukraine? The issues surrounding these questions were brilliantly covered on French radio programme RTL in a conversation between Yves Calvi and Francois Langlais. It was so well done, in fact, that Jan Scoils and I recreated their conversation for you in English. Last night, Russia announced the complete shutdown of gas deliveries to Angers, its French partner, starting Thursday. That's right, Dave. Deliveries had already decreased the amount the country would consume in just two days. France was already almost doing without Russian gas, thanks to alternative supplies. Moscow's decision was prompted by a payment dispute because Angers had decided to pay for only what was already delivered. That is to say, less than what was provided for in the contract. So why is Russia choosing to deprive itself of money? Well, Dave, in fact, Russia doesn't need funding. It is literally drowning in cash since the invasion of Ukraine. At the end of July, it had made 97 billion euros in hydrocarbon sales, mainly oil, according to the Wall Street Journal. Basically, it's 40 percent more than before the war. And in interest in volume, they are currently selling 7.4 million per day. That is only 600,000 less barrels than before the war. So you're telling me that Russia has never earned so much money through its gas and oil exports despite the sanctions? 
not despite the sanctions, but because of the sanctions, thanks to the sanctions, which have raised the prices by unleashing market speculation. A little less volume at much higher prices, and that means a lot more money. So we're tightening our belts, risking shortages and rationing for nothing. Listen, I would like to tell you the opposite, but yes, the sanctions that are causing all of this inflation have only served to fill Putin's coffers to unthinkable levels. And so far, these sanctions are punishing those who buy from Russia more than they are punishing Russia itself. So tell me, is it not the Europeans who buy the oil? According to estimates by the Centre for Research on Energy, European countries have paid Putin more than 86 billion since the start of the invasion. And that's mainly from Germany. And that is 3,700 euros per second. In the time that I've been speaking for about a minute and a half, more than 300,000 euros has gone from Europe to Russia. And that's without counting the other customers. So who are these other clients? I'm devastated to hear this. There are many other clients because there is no formal international embargo on the purchase of energy products. India, for example, which had never bought Russian oil before the war, is now buying one million barrels of oil a day. And China and Turkey are also very active. Saudi Arabia are buying Russian oil at a low price and it mixes it with Iranian oil. Now, I don't know what that does to a car, but Saudi Arabia are also buying cheap oil from Russia and reselling it at a higher price on the international market. All transport, financing and insurance for cargoes have been reorganised to get around the fact that Western companies are not dealing with Russia. And most importantly, America is watching all of this without intervening because they fear the rise in energy prices that would happen if the world really was deprived of Russian oil. Well, there you have it. We come full circle back to our introduction. Putin knows exactly where the West weaknesses lie. He knows it's so much more than a country between Russia and the EU. And our governments and policymakers know this too. Which leads to the question, are the sanctions just showboating? Are they just virtue signalling? And if so, for whose benefit? Answers on a postcard, please. And now for something a little different. Usually on Chart Watch, we discuss events that have happened in the week prior, or maybe movements in the gold price, as we did last time with Patrick Kareem. However, this week we asked Steve San Angelo about a graph that he had tweeted about a few days prior and was inevitably going to grab our attention. Shortages on the SLV are often discussed in the precious metal sphere. Many gold and silver investors find it nothing short of infuriating that the price of both the gold and silver seems to be more driven by demand for paper gold, ETFs, futures, than by physical bullion such as bars and coins. And whilst it's infuriating, movements in and out of paper markets can be excellent indicators of the state of play in the mining industry, bullion banks and the wider financial system. Have a listen to what Steve San Angelo thinks is going on with the SLV right now. There is, on at the time of this chart, and I believe still presently, there's a 60 million share short interest against the SLV. And that's pretty big because there's only 580 million shares 500, uh, total. So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's, it's a 1 billion short against a nine billion uh, asset of the SLV. And it's and the thing is what it shows is that the it's a 99.9% utilization rate. Now what that means is common in common uh, common uh, understanding, common uh, sense talking is that the the equities that are loaned out into the market um a 10% utilization rate means if 10% of those shares are loaned out as a short, that's, they, they say that's a high amount. Over 10% is a high amount. And the SLV is 99.9%. It's actually fallen. It's down to 99.5% today. <laughs> and so what that means is you, you can, the, that, that straight line means they can't borrow anymore. There's no more shares to borrow. Right. There's just no, there's really no more shares to borrow. And so the interesting dynamic that's taking place in the silver market is the commercials, the bullion banks, they're the ones that buy the metal from the mines, especially the primary silver miners. And so when they have a very high commercial net short position, that means the silver price is at a high. And back in March, during the peak, during the Russian Ukraine war, When the price of silver hit a high, the commercials had about a 70,000 net short position. A a week ago, they were long 
5,000 contracts. The big bullion banks were actually net long. Hmm. And we've only seen this three times. And so now they, they went net short because the price of silver a week ago was it hit it hit like a 17 and it went back, uh, it went back up to uh, 20. So they went net short 2,500 contracts as of last week. So the thing is, we've got the commercials who are now basically even, mm. or they have very low, they're, they're at the low. And when they're at a low commercial net short position, that tends to be the bottom in the silver price. Now, at the same time, Dave, we've got a record short position against the SLV. And there's a lot of speculation why that is. And the borrowing cost hit 7%. You go back to July, if you wanted to borrow shares on the SLV, you're going you're gonna to pay 0.2% to borrow those shares. Uh, uh, it, it's 7.1% it's uh, as of uh, last week, Friday. So it's, it's a very interesting dynamic to see these two opposites. And so uh, I think something is going to break. Some people believe this is going to be a big short squeeze, which means if the price of silver goes up, they're going to have to cover mm -hmm. and they're going to have to buy back these short interests. And so that pushes the price up even higher. To me, I don't know. I, 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 of course, I'm a, I'm a silver, uh, silver bu bu uh, bull. I would like to see the silver price go higher. But it, I think it is because the commercials are betting that the silver price isn't going to go much lower because you know why that is Dave, the primary miners, it costs them about $20 to produce silver. Hmm. They're not making any money. And now they've, why? Got an, now they've got an increase in the energy costs as well. Yeah. Well, uh, the energy price has fallen. I'm basing mine on the second quarter. Okay. There was, it was about 20, a little more than 20. Now it might be a little bit less because the energy prices have fallen since the first quarter, second quarter, mm -hmm. but not a lot, not a lot. So it's still probably, you know, in the upper 19s. So the, why would the bullion banks hedge? They hedge when the price of silver is well above the cost of production mm -hmm. and, and the speculators come in and that's when you get the large commercial net short position. And you have a lot of speculators going long, but now that the price is down below the cost of production, it doesn't make sense that the bullion banks are going to go more short mm. because they actually think the price is bottoming. I, you know, it doesn't make sense. And so I, it's a very interesting thing. If we, it all depends, Dave, what happens with the Federal Reserve. It could, we, it depends upon what the rate height is going to be and what the market reaction is. If that's very bullish for the markets and the silver price, we could get that short term short squeeze. And we could see those shorts having to cover because it's gonna be bullish for the markets and the metals. And that we could see a, you know, a two or three, $4 movement very quickly due to this very high short position. Hmm. Well, one more thing, do you know why it's changed? It used to be there was more silver on the exchanges, like on the comics and the LBMA. That's where the trading took place. Hmm. Do you know where the trading takes place now? On the ETFs. There's more silver in the global ETFs than there's on the comics and the LBMA. And I'm talking about the silver in the LBMA that's not accounted for. Hmm. for the ETFs. So uh, from my numbers, there's about, about 420 million ounces of registered silver on the, and the comics, LBMA and the Shanghai Futures Exchange, 420 million. There's almost 700 million ounces of silver held in the ETFs. So it's the movement in and out of the ETFs now that determines the price of silver, as well as the exchange but we're seeing more price action now coming from the ETFs. And so that's why it's very important now with this huge short position against the SLV. My thanks to Steve and Angelo for joining us on Chartwatch. And if you have any thoughts on the paper versus physical markets, then please let us know in the comments below. It's an area of discussion which has gained momentum and attention in the years following the financial crisis. And if the concerns around the silver paper market lead you to any conclusion, then let it be this one. Hold physical.
When you invest in physical gold and silver bullion through a company such as Goldcore, then you're significantly reducing the counterparty risk compared to when you own, say, a silver ETF or a silver futures contract. You're not relying on a number of layers of people who tell you that there is silver somewhere. When you own silver bars or coins, then they're stored for you in your name. After my chat with Steve Sanangelo on the future of the energy prices and what they really tell us about the times ahead, then I feel even more assured knowing I hold physical precious metals in my portfolio. If you have any questions at all about investing in gold and silver to protect your portfolio over the coming months and years, then please contact my colleagues at Goldcore today. But for now, I'll leave you with the worrying thoughts of Vladimir Putin to remind you of exactly why we should be prepared for tough times ahead. В такую ситуацию последовательно загоняла многолетняя безответственная макроэкономическая политика стран так называемой Большой Семерки, включая бесконтрольную эмиссию и накапливание необеспеченных долгов. Не придумав или не пожелав использовать другие рецепты, власти ведущих западных экономик просто-напросто запустили печатный станок. Таким нехитрым способом стали покрывать невиданные ранее бюджетные дефициты. Уже называл эту цифру. За последние два года, два года денежная масса в США выросла более чем на 38%. Это 5,9 триллиона долларов. Денежная масса Евросоюза, в свою очередь, также резко возросла за этот период. Ее объем увеличился примерно на 20% или на 2,5 триллиона евро. Сегодняшний рост цен, инфляция, проблемы с продовольствием и топливом, бензином, в энергетике в целом – это результат системных ошибок в экономической политике действующей администрации США и европейской бюрократии. Напечатали деньги в огромных количествах. А дальше что? Куда потекли все эти средства? Очевидно, в том числе на закупку товаров и услуг за пределами западных стран. Вот куда они потекли, эти деньги напечатанные. Они буквально стали пылесосить, выгребать глобальные рынки. Об интересах других государств, в том числе беднейших, естественно, никто не думал и думать-то не хотел. Им оставляли только, что называется, как у нас в народе говорят, ошметки, да еще и по астрономическим ценам. Так, если в конце 2019 -го года импорт Завоз товаров в Соединенных Штатах составлял порядка 250 миллиардов долларов в месяц, то к настоящему времени он вырос до 350 миллиардов долларов. Примечательно, что рост составил 40%. В пропорции это как раз и соответствует необеспеченной ничем накачке долларовой денежной массы последних лет. Вот напечатали, за эти, раздали деньги, и за эти деньги выгребли все товары с рынков третьих стран. Понятно, что такое резкое увеличение спроса необеспеченного товарным предложением запустило волну дефицитов и глобальную инфляцию. Вот она откуда, это глобальная инфляция. 